What happens when you take a Texas oil millionaire, give him unlimited budget, and tell him the only rule is win at any cost? You get a car so revolutionary, so devastatingly effective, that it was banned after just four races. Not because it was dangerous, not because it was illegal, but because it made everyone else look like they were standing still. Picture this. It's October 1970 at Riverside International Raceway. The Can-Am series is in full swing. The most brutal, no-holds-barred racing series on Earth where 1,000 horsepower monsters battle wheel-to-wheel -wheel at speeds approaching 200 miles per hour. The crowd watches as a strange white car rolls onto the track. It looks wrong, boxy, angular, like someone forgot to finish designing it. And then there's the noise, not just the thunderous V8, but something else. A high-pitched whine like a giant vacuum cleaner. The flagman drops the green, and Jim Hall's Chaparral 2J doesn't just lead the race. It disappears into the distance, 1.8 seconds faster per lap. In racing, that's not winning. That's humiliation. This is the story of the Chaparral 2J, the vacuum car, the sucker car, the car that broke every convention, violated the spirit of competition, and forced racing's governing body to rewrite the rulebook overnight. It remains the most controversial race car ever built, and 40 years later, its technology is still banned in every major racing series on Earth. To understand why Jim Hall built a race car with vacuum fans, we need to travel back to 1966. The Can-Am Challenge Cup had just begun. The Canadian-American Challenge Cup, though everyone just called it Can-Am. This was racing with virtually no rules, no engine size limits, no minimum weight, no restrictions on aerodynamics. The only requirements? Four wheels, two seats, and bodywork covering the wheels. That's it. The series attracted the best drivers in the world. Jackie Stewart, John Surtees, Dan Gurney, Bruce McLaren. These weren't just racers. They were engineers, innovators, men who understood that in Can-Am, the fastest car won, period. By 1969, Bruce McLaren's orange M8 cars dominated everything. These weren't just fast. They were engineering masterpieces. Aluminum monocoque chassis weighing just 1,750 pounds. Big block Chevrolet V8s pushing out over 700 horsepower. Massive rear wings generating hundreds of pounds of downforce. McLaren won 11 of 11 races in 1969. Total domination. But here's where it gets interesting. Jim Hall wasn't your typical racer. MIT educated engineer. Geology degree from Caltech made his fortune in oil and gas with his brother-in-law, Hap Sharp. While other teams were run by former mechanics or racing drivers, Hall approached racing like a scientist. His Chaparral Cars operation in Midland, Texas, was less race shop, more aerospace laboratory. Hall had been pioneering aerodynamics in racing since 1963. He was first to use a rear wing, first to use composite materials, First to put the radiators in the side pods. Every Chaparral innovation eventually became standard in racing. But the 2J would be different. This wouldn't evolve racing. This would break it. The problem Hall wanted to solve was fundamental. Down force. The aerodynamic force that pushes the car onto the track only works when you're going fast. Wings and spoilers need airflow to generate grip. At 150 miles per hour, Sure, you've got tons of downforce. But what about in slow corners? What about coming out of hairpins at 40 miles per hour? The car becomes loose, unpredictable, slow. Hall's engineer, a soft-spoken genius named Bob Sorensen, had an idea that sounded insane. What if we don't rely on the car moving through air? What if we move the air instead? The concept was breathtakingly simple and staggeringly complex at the same time. Two 17-inch fans, powered by a separate two-stroke Rockwell JLO snowmobile engine producing 55 horsepower at 6,000 RPM. These fans would suck air from underneath the car, creating a partial vacuum. Lexan plastic skirts 
the same bulletproof material used in fighter jet canopies, would seal the gap between the car and the ground, maintaining the vacuum regardless of suspension movement or track irregularities. The fans could move 9,650 cubic feet of air per minute. That's enough to empty a small bedroom every two seconds. The aerodynamic principle was ground effect taken to its logical extreme. Normal ground effect works by accelerating air under the car, creating low pressure through the Bernoulli principle, but that needs forward speed and carefully shaped tunnels. Hall's system created low pressure directly, mechanically, constantly, at any speed, even sitting still. The numbers were staggering. The vacuum system generated 1.25 to 150 degrees of downforce. Let me put that in perspective. A modern Formula One car, with all its wings and diffusers and millions in aero development, generates about 1.0 g in slow corners. The 2J did more than that at zero miles per hour. Parked. Building this monster required solving problems nobody had faced before. The auxiliary engine needed its own cooling system, its own fuel system, its own electrical system. The fans had to be balanced perfectly. Any vibration would destroy the drivetrain. The skirts had to be flexible enough to follow track irregularities, but rigid enough to maintain seal. They settled on Lexan strips in articulated sections, suspended on springs with Teflon rubbing blocks. Each skirt section could move independently, maintaining contact with the track surface at all times. The main power plant was relatively conventional by Can-Am standards, an all-aluminum Chevrolet ZL1 big block, 800 horsepower from 500 cubic inches, compression ratio of 12.1, four-barrel holly carburetor flowing once in 150 CFM, dry sump lubrication, the engine alone cost $6,000 in 1970, about $45,000 today. But in the 2J, this fire-breathing monster was almost an afterthought. The chassis was classic chaparral, aluminum monocoque with fiberglass body panels. But everything had to be modified for the vacuum system. The entire bottom of the car was sealed smooth aluminum sheeting. Air intakes had to be repositioned. The radiator exhausts couldn't interfere with the vacuum chamber. Even the suspension geometry was altered to maintain consistent skirt gaps through the full range of travel. Testing began at Rattlesnake Raceway, Hall's private track in Texas. The results defied belief. Cornering speeds increased by 20 to 30 percent. Braking distances shortened by 15 percent. The car could take corners that would throw a conventional car off the track. Test driver Phil Hill, the 1961 Formula One world champion, said it felt like cheating physics. But there were problems. The fans threw debris everywhere, stones, dust, pieces of rubber. Following the 2J was like driving through a sandblaster. The noise was unbearable. The auxiliary engine screamed constantly at 6,000 RPM. The skirts scraped and sparked on every bump. And then there was the psychological effect. Other drivers were terrified of it. Jackie Stewart called it unsafe. And this from a man who raced at the Nürburgring when trees lined the track. The 2J made its competition debut at Road America in August 1970. Jackie Oliver qualified second, just 0.3 seconds behind Dennis Hume's McLaren M8D. But Hume had 100 more horsepower. In race trim, the difference was obvious. Oliver could break 50 feet later into corners. He could take turns flat out that others had to lift for, but a suspension failure took him out after 32 laps. Still, the potential was clear. At Laguna Seca, the advantage was undeniable. Oliver qualified on pole 1.4 seconds faster than anyone else. In the race, he led easily until a drivetrain failure. The pattern continued, blistering speed mechanical failure. The 2J was too fast for its own components. Then came Riverside in October, 1.8 seconds faster in qualifying. Think about that. In a series where grid positions were separated by tenths of seconds, the 2J was nearly two seconds clear. It wasn't even close. Oliver led every lap until a suspension component failed with 23 laps to go, but everyone had seen enough. 
McLaren team principal Teddy Mayer filed an official protest. His argument? The fans constituted a movable aerodynamic device, banned under Article 2.9 of the regulations. Hall countered that the fans didn't move relative to the car, so they weren't movable in the regulatory sense. The steward sided with Hall initially. The 2J was legal, for now. The real opposition came from the other teams. Bruce McLaren had died testing the M8D earlier that year, but his team still dominated the championship. Lola, Ferrari, and BRM all threatened to withdraw if the 2J wasn't banned. They claimed it was dangerous, the debris, the noise, the unpredictability. But everyone knew the truth. They couldn't compete with it. At Hio, the final race at Riverside in November, the 2J led again before another mechanical failure. Four races, four mechanical DNFs, but also four dominant performances. The car had proven its point. It was unbeatable when it ran. On December 15, 1970, the Commission Sportive Internationale met in Geneva. The verdict was swift and decisive. The Chaparral 2J was banned. The fans were ruled a movable aerodynamic device. The rule was rewritten to be absolutely clear. No aerodynamic device could be powered by any source other than the forward motion of the car. The vacuum car was dead. But wait, there's more. The technology didn't die with the 2J. In 1978, Gordon Murray designed the Brabham BT46B fan car for Formula One. Murray claimed the fan was for cooling, but everyone knew better. Nicky Lauda won its only race by 34 seconds before Brabham voluntarily withdrew it, banned by politics, if not regulations. The 2J's influence went beyond racing. NASA studied Hall's ground effect principles for high-speed ground transport. The military examined the vacuum skirt technology for hovercraft development. The sealed floor concept became standard in modern racing, just without the fans. Today's Formula One cars generate massive ground effect downforce. They just have to do it the hard way. The technical legacy is everywhere. Modern racing cars use shaped floors and diffusers to create the same low pressure zone Hall achieved with fans. They use flexible ceiling strips, descendants of the 2J skirts, to maintain ground effect. The side mounted radiators, the smooth floor, the focus on underbody aerodynamics, it all started with the 2J. Let's talk numbers one more time, because they're just that incredible. The vacuum system generated 2,200 pounds of downforce at any speed. The fans consumed 55 horsepower, but the improved cornering more than made up for it. The car could theoretically drive upside down on a ceiling at just 40 miles per hour. No modern race car can do that. The cost? Hall spent an estimated $300,000 developing the 2J, about $2.2 million today. For comparison, McLaren's budget for their entire 1970 Can-Am program was about $150,000. Hall built just one complete car with a backup chassis that was never finished. The human cost was different. Phil Hill injured his knee when the skirts failed during testing, nearly ending his career. Mechanics suffered hearing damage from the auxiliary engine. Jackie Oliver later said driving the 2J was the most physically demanding experience of my racing career. The grip levels were so high it was exhausting to drive. Here's the thing about the Chaparral 2J. It wasn't just fast. It represented a fundamental shift in racing philosophy. Before the 2J, aerodynamics meant adding wings and spoilers, parasitic devices that created drag. The 2J showed another way, use the entire car as an aerodynamic device, create downforce without drag. It was so effective, so revolutionary, that racing still hasn't caught up. Fifty years later, powered ground effect is still banned in every major racing series. The surviving 2J, chassis number 001, sits in the Petroleum Museum in Midland, Texas. It's been restored to running condition. They fire it up occasionally for special events. The fans still work. The howl is still terrifying. 
and if you put it on a racetrack today with modern tires and a reliable drivetrain, it would probably still be competitive against modern Can-Am cars. So what was actually going wrong? Why did the 2J fail every race? The problem wasn't the concept. It was 1970 technology trying to handle 20 to 20 physics. The suspension components weren't designed for 2G cornering loads. The drivetrain couldn't handle the torque multiplication from having that much grip. The chassis itself would flex under the enormous forces. Hall was asking 1970 material science to support performance that wouldn't be seen again for decades. There's a deeper story here about innovation in racing. The 2J wasn't banned because it was unsafe. It wasn't banned because it was illegal. It was banned because it was too good. It made everyone else obsolete overnight. The racing establishment faced a choice, allow the 2J and watch one car dominate forever, or ban it and preserve competition. They chose competition. Was that the right choice? From a sporting perspective, probably. Racing needs close competition to survive as entertainment. But from an engineering perspective, we lost decades of potential innovation. Imagine if powered ground effect had been allowed to develop. Imagine the safety improvements from cars that could stop in half the distance. Imagine the efficiency gains from downforce without drag. Jim Hall never built another race car after 1970. He continued consulting, designing, innovating, but the 2J was his masterpiece and racing had rejected it. In a 1980 interview, he said, we proved you could make a car corner at physically impossible speeds. Racing responded by making it legally impossible instead. The philosophical question remains, should racing reward innovation or competition? The 2J forced that choice like no car before or since. It was too good for its own good, too revolutionary to live. It broke racing so thoroughly that racing had to break it back. Today, every Formula One team spends millions trying to seal their cars to the ground, trying to recreate what Hall did with $300,000 and a snowmobile engine. They use flexible floors, vortex generators, elaborate seal systems. They're all chasing the ghost of the 2J, just without the fans. Because the fans are still banned, they'll always be banned. The 2J made sure of that. Think about it. One car, four races, zero finishes, and it changed racing forever. Not bad for a vacuum cleaner with wheels. What's the most innovative race car you think was unfairly banned? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this deep dive into racing's most controversial car, hit that subscribe button for more stories of engineering brilliance that went too far. Until next time, keep those engines running and those fans off.